Okay. Ooh, that silenced people. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful morning it is to be in Detroit, right? I'm Emily Fiegel, and I have the privilege to be the president of the Michigan Museums Association. And on behalf of the Michigan Museums Association and the American Association for State and Local History, I welcome you to the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan. Thank you for coming. So I know not everybody was there, but did you all have a good time at the Detroit Historical Society last night? I'd like to take a moment to thank the vast number of people both involved with the MMA teams, the AASLH local host committee, and AASLH for helping to put together such an amazing experience for us all. Thank you so much. <laughs> So this conference gathers us under the theme of the spirit of rebirth. And maybe you've seen some of the physical evidence of rebirth in the construction you've encountered here in Detroit. Um, but that theme of rebirth is not unfamiliar to many of us in our organizations. In fact, the Michigan Museums Association is itself emerging from a period of transition and rebirth. Um, I would bet many of you in your own organizations are going through similar processes, perhaps emerging on the other end. Um, and so it's, it's a familiar theme, perhaps, to many of us. It is my pleasure to introduce um, Paula Ganglopadia, Deputy Director of the Museum Services for the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Paula is a visionary and entrepreneurial Michigan-grown leader. Just a few highlights from her career include serving as Director of Education and then Chief Learning Officer for the Henry Ford, Curator of Education for the Grand Rapids Public Museum, and she began her museum career in, as Executive Director of the Meridian Historical Village in Okemos, Michigan. I'd be remiss not to say that she has also done amazing things in a variety of other roles and projects as well. And for our Michigan Museum Association folks, you may remember that Paula spoke at our 2014 awards luncheon on Mackinac Island. Please join me in welcoming Paula Ginglo Padier. Good morning, Detroit. How is everyone doing? Great. Uh, you know, it does feel good to be the hometown girl, you know, uh, somebody from Michigan. And I was just recollecting last night that my last uh, ASLH conference was in Atlanta nearly a decade ago when I was actually the project uh, director for one of IMLS's, um, you know, grant uh, that I was leading for the, at the Public Museum in Grand Rapids. So I know that I'm uh, between you and uh, uh, the wonderful keynote speaker, so I will be very fast. Um, Tom from ASLH wanted me, uh, sorry, John wanted me to um, at least make you all aware of some of the exciting uh, opportunities that are available uh, through IMLS or the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We have a dedicated session, uh, sort of like Grants 101, Grant Writing 101, uh, later on that my colleagues will be offering. So I will not go into those details, uh, but I will mention some of the uh, agency's uh, priorities and focus areas so that, uh, and the timing is perfect because we just released our 2000. 17 NOFOs, or the Notice for Federal Funding, and, um, uh, you know, the, the awards. Uh, some of them have already been announced, the 2016 awards. Some of them have already been announced, and some will be uh, announced this week and next week. So I will get going, but I'm looking for a clicker to click. I think this is it, so bear with me. I hope this works. So... Um, Many of you already may know about uh, IMLS, or the Institute of Museum and Library Services. It is the federal agency which is the primary source of federal funding uh, for nearly um, 125,000 libraries and approximately 35,000 museums. Uh, apart from the grants that we give, um, you know, we uh, do trend studies, we do reports, we do convenings, um, and uh, you know, I, I won't get into too much details, but we also work um, hand in hand uh, both 
at all levels, at the local level, at the state level, regional level, as well as at the national level. We also work very closely uh, with the administration and other federal agencies. So um, some of the current uh, priorities uh, of IMLS, and I don't know how legible or how, if you can read all of them, I'll quickly go over them. We have three major initiatives that are currently um, in focus. One is transforming the role of libraries and museums from being community anchors to community catalyst. We just held a town hall in Philadelphia um, a week ago uh, that was attended by nearly 80 representatives from libraries and museums. The result of that uh, would be a, a white paper. We have done literature survey, and we are hoping that we will be able to come up with some framework and tools that any museum, you know, doesn't matter what size you are, what discipline you represent, can take and replicate and really position Position yourself um, on the social well-being aspect, and you know, being a leader in the community. Uh, parallel to that initiative is uh, the Veterans Initiative. Uh, amongst many audiences that all museums focus, we are focusing on veterans and military families, and we are again going to be holding a town hall in November. Uh, we'll be doing literature survey and research, and then we'll be generating frameworks and tools. So those two initiatives are major initiatives. They are multi-year initiatives, meaning they will go on uh, for the next four years. So please do uh, look out for it. Um, my staff and our, myself will be in the audience. If you have, uh, if you believe you're an anchor or you're already doing work in, in these initiatives, please find us and because we would love to dialogue with you. Um, both for museums and libraries, collections are, uh, you know, they are, uh, are, they form our core. So building the capacity of collection uh, continues to remain one of the three main priorities. Uh, the next column is scale up. As you may know that uh, IMLS has been uh, funding uh, over many years um, programs around STEM education, uh, but we are now going to scale up that initiative and uh, a new strand of funding is going to be funding STEM engagement with experts. It's called STEMx. So that initiative is also uh, just rolling out. Uh, we have also invested a lot in early childhood um, learning and initiatives, and I'm sure many of you have been working in that area. We are taking a pause and we are trying to see what we can do where there is still a need. And we have uh, identified that there is still a need to offer training and capacity building opportunities for families and caregivers. So the early childhood learning, again, is poised for scale up, but with a certain focus. And then um, the national digital platform has always been a focus for IMLS. The libraries are, you know, are, are working a lot in that area. Uh, what we want to do is we want to build the capacity of museums, small, medium, large, um, to really start embracing uh, technology. And then, like I mentioned, we study trends. So there are some exploratory uh, initiatives around open education resources, crowdsourcing, gaming as a tool, the changing demographic with the new, new Americans, um, those, you know, conversations will continue. And last but not the least, we are continuing to focus on professional development of, um, of staff, both in the museum and the library side. So those are a couple of uh, initiatives that I wanted to highlight to you. Hopefully this will work. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Oh, it's going backwards. Okay. So um, the Office of Museum and Library Services, apart from the grants that we give, we give out close to uh, over $30 million of grants. Uh, we also recognize museums uh, across the nation um, with, with the national medals that are given at the White House. We also give out youth awards, and like I mentioned, we do uh, convenings um, as well as strength studies. So this is a quick snapshot of the grants that we give out. We have four different categories uh, in our workshop that we'll be giving. Staff will be going over it. But I just wanted to highlight that the deadline for the next cycle is December 1st, so it's coming up. We really encourage all of you uh, to apply for these grants, Museums for America, 
national leadership grants for museums. Um, Sparks has been included in national leadership grants. And then we have special grants for African American museums and Native American and Native Hawaiian museums. Um, quick, chain, uh, quick mention of a big change that we did for the funding categories. We have raised the caps for the Museums for America programs which used to be $150,000 to $500,000. And we have raised the cap for the National Leadership Grant for Museums from $500,000 to a million dollars. So we really are encouraging museums to think big, think out of the box, and you know collaborate and apply for these type of uh, fundings. A couple of special features that you'll see in the, in the funding that we are calling out as special interest of IMLS, we are seeking col uh, projects to be collaborative, not just within the museum community, but in uh, you know, encouraging cross-sector uh, partnerships, because there are many new players in the arenas that museums are working on. Uh, we are also definitely highlighting digital technology, uh, embracing digital technology, deploying digital technology, whether it is collections, whether it is um, engagement, staff training, and all of that. Uh, we are encouraging all of you to recognize the importance of evaluation, whether it is formative or summative evaluation, because without showing impact, whether it is federal funding or funding from else, it's very difficult to sustain programs. We are also, like I mentioned, focusing on professional development, uh, inclusivity. We want museums to not just, um, you know, say we are reaching out to at-risk youth, uh, like the demographic is changing. There are many, many special communities, so really thinking broad. And the details of all of these are in the 17 NOFOs. Um, being interdisciplinary and, uh, you know, the STEM and early learning, which I already mentioned. So uh, a quick call out again for the national medals. I wanted to show you this pie chart because the biggest chunk of the pie is from the History Museum. So kudos to all of you. Uh, so, you know, I, I, as I was looking through, I said, I really need to share this good story. But we get only about 75 to 80 nominations. And I'm really encouraging all of you to apply. The, if you're doing exemplary work, nominate yourself. Ask somebody to nominate you. Because I tell you, it is, it is a life-changing experience you know, when you get recognized uh, amongst the pool. Only five museums get uh, selected along with five libraries. And we have been very fortunate over the past couple of years. The First Lady has hosted, you know, this event and the reception at the White House. So again, October 3rd, that's coming up. Please apply. We also um, host uh, and coordinate the uh, NAHEP Awards, which used to be called Coming Up Taller Awards. These are youth awards for um, arts and humanities for focused organizations for after-school programs. The deadline for that is coming up you know, soon. Apart from the discretionary grants that we give out, we are also working with certain organizations um, to focus on capacity building. Museums for All is an initiative of IMLS in partnership with the Association of Children's Museum, where we are encouraging museums to provide free or reduced admission to those who hold the EBT cards. And currently we have over 120 um, museums, uh, both Children's Museum and other. Again, if you're interested, please do contact some of us because we really want to uh, you know, provide opportunities for those um, who do not have these sort of opportunities. We're also partnering um, with certain state organizations, state museum organizations, on phase two of Museums United, which is again focused on capacity building and offering coordinated opportunities. Uh, we have been very active in the field of making. Um, you know, we're working with Children's Museum, Exploratorium, the Make Movement, and all of these resources that are coming out of IMLS-funded projects are for all of you to, you know, to tap into for free. So just wanted to share some of these. Again, we all are aiming at collective impact, uh, some of the things which are opportunities as well as challenges. You know, digital technology, encourage you to, you know, embrace that. 
um, you know, be relevant, especially for I've worked my entire professional career in um, history museums. So if we do not marry content with context, you know, it's, it's really difficult to be, to be relevant. Um, again, you know, be, be proactive, uh, be interdisciplinary, and aim for that collective impact. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm here for the next two days. Wonderful seeing you, and have a great conference. To the benefit of everybody, I resisted the temptation to dance on my way up. That was, it's a nice segue, though. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Jansen. I am the executive director of Bruce Moore in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I am proud to represent the program committee uh, for the 2016 annual meeting. Uh, it's my honor to be able to introduce a speaker, and that I have about an hour's worth of notes, but bear with me. I had the privilege of working in and around Detroit uh, in the museum community for over a decade. I learned a deep respect for the people and for the epic history of this region. Detroit has reinvented itself repeatedly over three centuries and has played significant roles in the major plot lines of our national story. As a trade hub, as a military outpost in the 18th century, a terminus on the Underground Railroad, birthplace of the automobile industry, the arsenal of democracy. Detroit is hockey town, it is motor town, it's Motown. It has been and is a great American city. In the footnotes of that sweeping narrative, however, lie 20th century subplots of economic disparity, racial disharmony, and political dysfunction. In the process of recovering from those forces, the citizens of Detroit are once again working to forge a new way forward looking for solutions to long-simmering problems. Their journey inspired the theme for this year's con uh, conference. Their challenge is formidable. Overcoming the forces of the past begins with disentangling the disparate influences that brought us to this point. In any era, that would be difficult. But compounding the problem, I believe, is that we seem to be increasingly desperate for simple answers and quick solutions to complex issues. Effective democracy requires an informed citizenry. And that's where we can be a key. We have a responsibility as keepers of the past to investigate and to share in that complexity. And the work of Thomas Segrou reflects an extraordinary contribution to that effort. His first book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, is a disciplined, methodical, relentless interpretation of the data that speaks to understanding the contemporary issues facing Detroit. It won the Bancroft Prize in American History, the Philip Taft Prize in Labor History, the President's Book Award of the Social Science History Association, and the Urban History Association Award for Best Book in North American Urban History. In 2005, Princeton University Press selected Origins of the Urban Crisis as one of its 100 most influential bo books of the last 100 years. Dr. Segrew is currently a professor of social and cultural analysis and history at New York University. As a specialist in 20th century politics, urban history, civil rights, and race, he was educated at Columbia, King's College, Cambridge, and Harvard, where he earned his PhD in 1992. I will also note for the Detroiters in the room that he received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Wayne State University as well. As you marvel this week at what Detroit is and as you look for evidence of what Detroit was, Dr. Segrew's work is an indispensable part of understanding the connection between the two. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, please welcome to the stage Dr. Thomas Segrew. Thank you very much for joining me on this really beautiful day um, in this extraordinary city. Um, 
In 1805, Detroit burned in one of the many fires that devastated cities in the early modern and early industrial world. And from that fire came the city's motto, which I will not uh, read to you in Latin. Um, my Catholic education um, left me without Latin, uh, shockingly. Uh, but it translates roughly as, we hope for better things, it will arise from the ashes. Rising from the ashes is a theme that uh, seems to be pertinent to Detroit's long history from its devastating fire in 1805 uh, to uh, the series of violent racial conflicts that tore the city apart during the Second World War, including one of the largest race riots in 20th century American history, including uh, the uprising on the city's streets in the long hot summer of 1967 and including the place where I will begin my talk this morning, the city's bankruptcy in uh, July of 1913, uh, July of 2013. Uh, I am a historian, but I am talking here about the very recent past. On July 17th, 2013, the city of Detroit filed for bankruptcy in federal court, the largest municipality in American history to do so. The previous decade had been a grim one for the city. Between 2000 and 2010, Detroit lost a staggering 25% of its population, facing, uh, I'm sorry, falling to just uh, a, a little over 700,000. It's somewhere now in the upper 600,000s. The city's population had peaked uh, in 1950 at just uh, about 1.85 million and may have gone up a little in the early 1950s, reaching nearly 2 million, to give you a sense uh, of what's transformed uh, demographically in the city uh, since the mid-century. Depending on how you measure it, depending how, on how you measure it, between 21 and 40 square miles of this 139 square mile city is empty. This uh, is a map that shows the change in population in Detroit between 2000 and 2010. Uh, and this map uh, is a, a map that shows uh, the density of vacant land in the city. The areas with the orange, uh, yellow, and green uh, uh, basically are a scale, the orange being the areas with the highest rates of abandonment, uh, the areas that are, are green, the areas with the lowest rates of abandonment. So you can see just by looking at this map of Detroit's 139 square miles uh, that uh, there are vacant properties in just about every section of the city. By best estimate, about 900,000, I'm sorry, 90,000, I'm having trouble with numbers this morning, uh, 90,000 houses are abandoned, a staggering figure. The city was ravaged by the home finance crisis. In 2007 alone, 62% of all subprime loans in the metropolitan area went to African Americans. Uh, many of those uh, houses were foreclosed upon and then joined the ranks of abandoned properties in the city. Even more stunning are the figures of tax foreclosures, that is properties that are foreclosed upon for the non-payment, even for trivial amounts uh, of, uh, of, of taxes. About one in seven of all properties in Detroit uh, since the crisis of 2008 have fallen into tax foreclosure, meaning that they're being repossessed by the Wayne County government. Uh, if you look at the city's uh, streetscape, you'll see that large parts of Detroit, um, this is an aerial photograph of the city's east side. Um, these are photographs that I took on the city's east side in the summer of 2013. Um, large sections of the city today have become, in effect, rural. Uh, nearly every street shows the ravages of foreclosures, of tax foreclosures, and of depopulation. This is a street of a typical uh, Detroit landscape of 1920s era uh, single family detached homes, most of them on one eighth uh, of an acre lots, uh, uh, nearly all of them uh, left to the elements. Um, 
In many parts of the city, um, houses begin to crumble very rapidly. Um, these are houses that um, have been exposed to the elements, and as any of you who are into historic preservation or who own an old house will know, um, the infiltration of water uh, is devastating to old houses, and within a few years, a property can go from being intact uh, to being taken over by trees and vines uh, and begin to crumble away. Um, this area, Brush Park, uh, which is just north of here, a couple of miles, um, is now undergoing some uh, rehabilitation. But you can see signs of Detroit's late 19th century wealth when it was still a second or third tier city um, in these glorious uh, 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 brick houses, um, many of which uh, have simply disappeared or been left to rot. Detroit properties are also ravaged by arson. Uh, Detroit became infamous uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s uh, for the so-called Devil's Night incidents where people lit houses on fire. Uh, but uh, uh, the city doesn't have the capacity uh, to deal with uh, the epidemic of arson and many of its properties. And so in houses and blocks with abandoned houses, you often see properties like this, uh, not only left to the elements, but burned to a crisp. Large parts of the city, a city that, remember, um, originally housed uh, or was uh, at its peak housed 1.85 million people, large sections of the city today seem eerily deserted. Um, this is an area not far from the pretty thriving cultural center or midtown, the area around Wayne State University, around uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts uh, and various hospitals. But you can see this was not taken at five in the morning or six in the morning. You can tell the shadows. Um, it's taken in the middle of the day uh, and the streets are nearly devoid of activity. Detroit uh, saw a population shift uh, that was also characterized by a fact of its history that I will return to later. That is, uh, Detroit uh, became an overwhelmingly African-American city, the, process of, uh, the result of the process of more than 60 years of massive white flight away from the city center toward the suburbs and increasingly uh, former rural areas in the exurbs. Detroit today has a population that's only 7.8% white. 82.2% of Detroiters are African Americans. And so the shifts that have taken place on the city's landscape, its depopulation, uh, its uh, vacancy and abandonment, uh, uh, the disinvestment from its properties, um, have a disproportionately negative effect on the city's overwhelming majority, four-fifths of the city's uh, population being African American. Detroit was also ravaged in the first decade uh, and beyond of the 21st century uh, by uh, the economic crash. In 2009, unemployment in Detroit peaked at 24.9%, and it fell only gradually, not recovering nearly as quickly as a national economy, indeed not recovering nearly as quickly as the Michigan economy, which has done relatively well in the last few years. Uh, this this uh, chart shows the trajectory of unemployment rates in Detroit um, over time. Um, and I would also note that if I were to break out these statistics by race, um, African-American unemployment in Detroit has been consistently twice that uh, of uh, white Detroiters, uh, a pattern uh, that has uh, persisted through good times and bad, through economic crises as well as economic booms. Only one auto factory remains in the city that once called itself the Motor City. There's another that straddles the boundary between D Detroit um, and one of its older suburbs. This restructuring of the city's economy, which I'll talk more about later, um, has had really significant consequences for those who dwell within the city proper. Today in Detroit, Chrysler and General Motors employ only about 8,000 workers altogether. The collapse of the auto industry within the boundaries of the city of Detroit is part of a long process that I'll return to later as the uh, auto industry decentralized. But the fact is that Detroit in the era of the bankruptcy is no longer in any meaningful sense the motor city. It's a city that employs a, a significant population in the auto industry, 
but many more uh, in other sectors of the economy, particularly, and we'll return to them as well, uh, higher education, uh, municipal, state, and federal government, uh, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the healthcare sector. As we look out onto this bankruptcy Detroit, as we look out onto the state of Detroit in the early 21st century, as we look out onto the state of Detroit uh, as it struggled with an unprecedented depopulation, disinvestment, uh, vacancy crisis, and its uh, bankruptcy, we need to take a look at some of the explanations for what happened to Detroit. There is a commonplace set of explanations for Detroit's woes. The conventional wisdom about Detroit goes something like this. Detroit was a thriving city, a model for uh, the world in terms of being an arsenal of democracy, the center of the world's most important industry in the 20th century, the automobile industry. Uh, and it was a city that was supposedly becoming a model city of race relations, where African Americans and whites and the ideals of civil rights were beginning to come to fruition. Then, July 23rd, 1967, when the city erupted in one of uh, the most violent uprisings of the 20th century, ultimately leading uh, to 43 deaths, more than 7,000 arrests, uh, and uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars of property destroyed, mostly through arson and looting. The explanation of Detroit uh, as uh, having burned uh, in 1967 is part of the story. But the next part of the story focuses on the transformation of the city's racial politics. In this version of the city's history, still widely held, uh, Detroit was driven downward by the rise of black power and a pernicious African-American identity politics in the aftermath of 1967. The embodiment of this uh, is still probably the most controversial mayor in Detroit's history, Coleman A. Young, uh, the first African-American mayor of Detroit, elected in 1973. He served for two decades. Many look to the Young administration and make an argument that he single-handedly poisoned whites in metropolitan Detroit against the ideals of civil rights, against the city's African-American population, and against regional cooperation. One of the most powerful images that I don't have a picture of, but you've probably all walked past it just a few blocks away, is the famous and somewhat controversial statue of Joe Lewis uh, on the riverfront, the disembodied arm uh, in, the, in the fist uh, pointing out. Uh, when it went up during the Young administration, there was a great deal of uh, brouhaha about it. Many saw it as um, a distortion of the black body. Um, but the most common critique of it was that this was uh, the imposition of a, a symbol of black power onto the city's landscape, a fist a black fist pointing angrily into the face of white Detroiters. Indeed, a Detroit Free Press cartoonist, and I've yet to be able to find a good copy of it to reproduce from my slides, a Detroit Free Press cartoonist showed Mayor Coleman Young uh, uh, depositing the Joe Lewis fist along Eight Mile Road, the boundary separating Detroit uh, and its mostly white uh, uh, northern suburbs, uh, uh, the fist pointing across Eight Mile uh, at whites. So the Detroit mythology suggests that African Americans, the city's by the 1970s majority population, and politicians like Young, who, uh, who played to racial grievances, are responsible for the city's woes. If only somehow we could roll the clock back, back before 1967, if only somehow we could capture that moment uh, of opportunity before the city burst uh, into riot uh, in uh, the 1960s, if only somehow, uh, then Detroit uh, would have remained a city of 1.85 million people, a city with a, a vital economy, a city that was a magnet for migrants and immigrants from around the world. The, the blame on Detroit politicians um, extends forward to uh, the uh, mayor who was perhaps most uh, directly responsible for the events that precipitated Detroit's bankruptcy claim in 2013. This was Kwame Kilpatrick, 
um, seen here. Oops, I, sorry, I, I didn't make him come up. I made him come up on my computer. Um, this is Kwame Kilpatrick, uh, Detroit's hip hop mayor, uh, as he was called uh, in the early 2000s, uh, a young African American from a political family, uh, someone who was hailed by uh, the uh, the right to center democratic uh, organization, the Democratic Leadership Conference, as uh, the embodiment of a new form of, uh, of Democrat, economically conservative, but culturally relevant, someone who could speak to a younger generation while simultaneously uh, making deals with business uh, and uh, being fiscally austere. Well, he proved to be neither one of those, uh, and many point to the Kilpatrick administration, um, to corruption, uh, to uh, the deal making with various uh, contractors that he worked, uh, uh, that, that uh, he was friends with, um, self dealing, uh, a, a, an affair with his chief of staff that ultimately became uh, national news when a series of, um, in, uh, e of, of text messages came uh, to light. Uh, uh, and again, uh, this is an example of the ways in which Detroit's history tends to come down to a focus on prominent controversial figures. What I'd like to suggest today is that we need to think not just about the histories of various political leaders, but to think more broadly about the transformations that remade uh, Detroit and many other cities like it in the 20th century. So what I want to do for the next few minutes uh, is to take a look at the ways in which uh, the Detroit's bankruptcy and the current state of Detroit, both the crisis and the opportunity, need to be understood historically and to think about the ways in which looking at the city's past and present through the lens of history um, can help us think about the ways that Detroit can move forward, the ways that Detroit can rise from the ashes. If we look out onto Detroit and its history over the last uh, several decades, we have to come to grips with a series of major changes uh, that transformed its landscape, transformed its economy, uh, fundamentally shaped its race relations as well as the race relations of the United States writ large. These fundamental transformations uh, played out in lots of places, uh, sometimes with effects as devastating as they did in Detroit, sometimes to a lesser degree. But let's focus on them for a moment. First, deindustrialization or the collapse of the city's uh, manufacturing economy and disinvestment. Second, persistent discrimination by race in the workplace despite the gains of the civil rights movement uh, from the middle of the 20th century on forward. Third, persistent residential segregation by race or the balkanization of metropolitan Detroit into racialized territories uh, uh, that both determined uh, how public goods and resources like public education would be allocated and how much we paid for them in taxes would be allocated, but at the same time, uh, created uh, communities of mutual hostility and suspicion, uh, which poisoned uh, local, state, and national politics with long-term consequences. Next, and related to that, the ways in which Detroit and many other major American cities began to be marginalized, both in the national capital and in the state capital. Any one of these changes, any one of these shifts, deindustrialization, Persistent workplace discrimination despite civil rights, residential segregation by race, the marginalization of cities in federal and state policy, any one of these would have had devastating consequences. But the fact that all of them occurred simultaneously remade Detroit in ways that we have to reckon with today. This is an aerial photograph of Detroit taken on the brink of the Second World War when Detroit uh, was the capital of capitalism, the home to the nation's auto industry, uh, an industry that employed one in every six working Americans at its peak. This is a landscape of extraordinary wealth and prosperity. You'll see a streetscape dominated by single-family detached houses packed together. Detroit was a city where blue-collar workers uh, at the city's peak could afford their own homes, uh, and, uh, uh, and you can see a landscape that was also laid out to accommodate Detroit's signature product, the automobile. 
This is a city, for any of you who have even spent a few hours poking around during this conference, a city that is built around the automobile. It does not look like New York or Philadelphia or Baltimore or Boston. As Detroit grew, it grew on the shoulders of its mighty automobile industry. Um, this is uh, maybe one of the most important sites in the city's automotive history, the Ford Highland Park plant, the place where the $5 day and the assembly line were introduced uh, in 1914. This is perhaps the most important of the icons of industrial Detroit at its peak. This is the Ford River Rouge plant uh, that uh, uh, at its peak during the Second World War employed 90,000 workers doing everything from hauling coal uh, uh, off of an oar off of the boats that came into its specially built harbor uh, to the construction of every part of the car, the steel that was then molded into stampings, uh, the engine the glass, and so forth. This was the epitome of what urban geographers called Fordism, or a complete industrial landscape, uh, uh, where every aspect of the automobile was constructed. This, of course, is uh, a, a symbol of Detroit's power during the Second World War. This is a Chrysler tank plant, um, and uh, Detroit uh, adapted to the demands of the Second World War and was the major producer for nearly every element of, the Detroit, uh, of America's military arsenal. Um, and these are some of the extraordinary buildings that existed on Detroit's landscape at its industrial peak. Uh, this, uh, the Packard Motor Car Company on the city's east side, now entirely abandoned, uh, like many of Detroit's great industrial buildings, was designed by the architect Albert Kahn. Uh, Kahn went on to uh, be the industrial architect for Soviet Russia, for Germany, for modern Japan. He and his firm uh, were responsible for really importing Detroit uh, to the rest of the world world, not just its cars, but its industrial design. Uh, this is a Packard plant in 1957, just before it closed. Um, and this is the Packard plant and its ruins today, uh, a common site for the so-called ruins pornographers uh, uh, who travel to Detroit to traipse around the corpses uh, of dead factories like this one. Large parts of uh, the Packard plant and many other old industrial buildings in Detroit have been stripped of their, uh, of their metal uh, by scrappers. Uh, uh, there was a, an Onion headline a few years back uh, that um, was only half in jest, which is w read something to the effect of Destroy Detroit dismantled, sold for scrap. Um, indeed, when I was here um, at the Packard plant, when I took this picture, um, I was with a film crew from the BBC. Um, and as we were there, uh, there were um, two separate repair crews um, one from the water department that was replacing sewer lids that had been pulled up and sold for scrap. Another uh, from Detroit Edison that was replacing the copper wire in the electrical wires um, that had been stripped uh, by, by scavengers. This uh, 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 abandoned uh, building was purchased for a song by a, a wealthy South American investor who has yet to be determined plans for its adaptive reuse. It extends for nearly a mile uh, along rail lines uh, on the city's uh, uh, east side. Detroit lost most of its jobs in a period that began amidst extraordinary national prosperity. The disappearance of places like the Packard plant, the dramatic downsizing of the Ford River Rouge and Highland Park plants did not happen after the advent of uh, the rise of competition from the Japanese and Germans in the 1970s or the oil shocks of 1973. Rather, it happened during the 1950s. Between 1947 and 1963, Detroit lost about 140,000 manufacturing jobs. This when there was no significant international competition and when oil prices uh, were very affordable and American car companies were build building giant uh, five mile an hour gallon behemoths uh, that took to the road. So in thinking about the transformation of Detroit uh, and especially its economy, we have to go back historically to look at the ways in which landscapes like this were the product of American capitalism at its peak, not the product uh, of uh, what happened in the 1970s and beyond, although those uh, economic woes certainly exacerbated Detroit's problems. In thinking about Detroit, 
we need to think about the ways in which its vernacular architecture, its landscape, was very much a product of both the automobile industry and the unionized jobs that provided workers with money uh, to rent or buy single-family homes. But we also need to think about that landscape, and these are typical Detroit homes. These are from the 1920s. Um, these are from the 1940s. Uh, we also need to think about these landscapes reflecting not just the might of the city's economy and the wealth, the aggregate wealth of its workers, uh, but also thinking about it in terms of the city's very troubled racial history. Detroit attracted uh, 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 hun uh, hundreds of thousands, ultimately, of African Americans, many of them refugees from the brutal system of Jim Crow in the South, many of them seeking economic opportunity uh, in the city's booming auto industry, particularly during the Second World War. The auto industry provided jobs for African Americans um, that were unavailable in large parts of the country unionized jobs, jobs that provided some security, uh, jobs that provided uh, retirement benefits uh, and comfort in old age. Yes, African Americans were disproportionately confined to the lowest and meanest and dirtiest jobs in the auto industry, but the auto industry provided a leg up uh, of opportunity for black and white workers alike. Detroit workers put that money disproportionately into two things, their cars and their homes. But the landscape of Detroit was shaped profoundly by uh, different access to housing on the part of whites and African Americans. White Detroiters had access to newly constructed houses in the entire metropolitan area. African Americans, by contrast, were confined to predominantly black neighborhoods, mostly in older, run-down sections of the city. This was a result of federal policy. The Federal Housing Administration, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, and the Veterans Administration all uh, had uh, a, a profound effect on the restructuring of housing markets in the United States, making it possible for millions of Americans to own their own homes for the first time. But those programs, until the civil rights legislation, fairly tepid uh, around housing in the late 1960s, uh, those programs uh, uh, explicitly discriminated against people of color. It meant that it was possible for a white Detroiter to get access to a conventional, uh, federally guaranteed 30-year mortgage with a low down payment uh, and uh, a, a long time to pay off, allowing them to buy their own homes. Federal policy segregated Detroit. Real estate brokers played a critical role in the segregation of the metropolitan area by refusing to show homes to African Americans in uh, all white neighborhoods and vice versa, a process that's been documented going on right up to nearly the present day called racial steering, or steering buyers uh, in a way uh, that reinforces patterns of segregation. And in my research on Detroit, I found that between the mid-1940s and the mid-1960s, uh, nearly every African-American household who was the first or second to move into a formerly white neighborhood was the target uh, of uh, attacks on the part of their white neighbors. Indeed, white Detroiters organized uh, to preserve the racial segregation and homogeneity of their neighborhoods, uh, doing it uh, through protest. Uh, here, uh, they put up a sign in 1942 to protest the construction of, a, of housing for black war workers in a predominantly white neighborhood. They organized more than 200 white neighborhood associations to keep uh, African Americans out. Uh, and uh, they uh, worked politically, including very closely with the mayor uh, for whom this building is named, Albert Cobo, uh, to uh, preserve residential segregation by race uh, uh, throughout uh, the city. This is perhaps one of the most egregious examples of, uh, still exists on the city's landscape. This is a, a, a foot thick, six foot high cement wall um, that runs uh, for a half a mile between a neighborhood that was designated as all white 
and one that was designated as African American. This was built uh, uh, on Detroit's far north side near Eight Mile Road um, in uh, the early 1940s. A reminder of the ways in which uh, segregation took physical form uh, in the city's landscape. This is a great picture from uh, a New Deal photographer of uh, African-American kids standing along that wall in 1941. Um, it's a great photo for so many reasons. It'd be great for an exhibit, but one is, of course, the small detail of the African-American girl holding a white doll, uh, which I think is just very telling. But you can see the magnitude of the wall um, and the ways in which it symbolized uh, what was a persistent uh, reality in metropolitan Detroit. It's no surprise then that when whites moved uh, uh, away from the center, the African-American population didn't move with them. This is uh, uh, just a very quick uh, series of maps that I prepared showing Detroit's racial population. Each uh, dot represents uh, about 200 African-Americans. Uh, and you can see that the African-American movement within the city's landscape between 1940 at the top and 1970 at the bottom was not random. It followed patterns uh, that were established by this multi-tiered system of apartheid by federal government policy, by real estate brokers, and by whites resisting African-American movement. History doesn't just get wiped away, as we all know from our profession. This is a map of metropolitan Detroit in 2010, uh, prepared by scholars at the City University of New York. Blue are neighborhoods, uh, they, this is the same dot density map as the one I showed previously, blue uh, uh, is African American, red is white, and you can see down in the corner, and we can talk more about them later, um, yellow uh, is uh, 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 Latino um, or Hispanic. Uh, but what you can see here is that 60 years after the wall was built, 70 years after the wall was built, uh, Detroit's African-American population remains largely confined within the boundaries of the city um, and to some adjoining um, suburban places and to a few small communities and outlying areas that, ha for historic reasons, had African-American populations dating back sometimes to the 1920s. So, as we think about uh, Detroit, as we think about the processes that remade the city's landscape, we need to think about the ways in which Detroit is reimagining and reinventing itself. How are Detroiters coming to grips with the city's troubled past? How is Detroit reinventing itself? How is Detroit rising from the ashes in the aftermath of the bankruptcy? Detroit right now, I will contend, is at a historic crossroads. Having resolved the bankruptcy, having seen an infusion of money from philanthropies and uh, uh, from investors as well as from the federal government uh, uh, to begin redeveloping the city, how does Detroit deal with the long-term legacies of disinvestment and depopulation, of intense racial segregation, uh, of deindustrialization? How does Detroit reimagine itself uh, as a future city? So what I'm going to talk about for the next few moments are some of the ways in which Detroit is being reimagined. And you are direct witnesses to Detroit's transformation, uh, which based on the really loud noise outside of my hotel room last night began at about 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, uh, and which is really um, transforming um, a large part of the area right around us, uh, which planners uh, and developers are calling Greater Downtown Detroit. This is an area of about 7.2 square miles out of a city of 139 square miles. And uh, you can see um, uh, all over the place signs of this strategy to revitalize and transform the city, to overcome the city's past. This is a, a window from Opportunity to, to Detroit. Um, this is an, uh, uh, a, a venture of one of the most prominent uh, developers, um, Dan Gilbert of Quicken Loans, uh, who has invested uh, uh, huge amounts of money in Detroit, hundreds of millions of dollars at least. Um, uh, um, Quicken Loans, of course, was a really significant player in the 2008 national mortgage and foreclosure crisis, um, but it's also an incredibly lucrative business. Uh, Gilbert had begun his efforts in urban revival in Cleveland, uh, in downtown Cleveland, once referred to as the mistake on the lake, uh, now a, a place with a, a, a downtown that looks a lot like Detroit. 
Um, you can see signs of uh, downtown Detroit's revival. This is the old Kern Block, which was a department store um, that was demolished several decades ago, replaced now by the headquarters of CompuWare, a software firm. It's in trouble at the moment, but that's a different story. Um, but uh, um, What's interesting is I took this photograph uh, in the summer of 2014 um, on a nice day, very, very pretty day at 10 to 5, and despite the corporate headquarters existing in the downtown, it's still a pretty quiet downtown by the standards of many American pedestrian-oriented downtowns. Um, downtown Detroit has some of the most visible ruins uh, from the city's heyday as one of the richest cities in the world. Many of its skyscrapers built uh, in the first 30 years of the 20th century um, were either empty, uh, profoundly disused, or, or in this case, entirely abandoned. Um, many of them now have become attractive parcels for um, redevelopment as cities are back and as uh, uh, investors are realizing that buying these buildings at a bargain basement price and converting them into housing can be quite lucrative. You can see this is Woodward Avenue. Now it has uh, uh, a light rail line on it, a privately funded primarily um, uh, light rail line that's going to connect downtown and um, the midtown or cultural center area. Um, this is during the construction project. I took this a couple summers ago. Um, uh, and you can see signs all over the place of the rebuilding that's happening um, in downtown, a uh, formerly abandoned skyscraper um, with the smell of sawdust uh, reanimating it. Here you can see the final touches on a, a former um, office building being converted into condominiums to attract wealthy empty nesters or young people into the city. Um, and here you can see the site just north of downtown. This is an aerial view of about a year and a half ago, uh, an area with massive abandonment, surface parking lots, empty lots, um, that is now being converted into uh, the billion dollar plus um, heavily subsidized from the state, in particular, um, Hockey Town, uh, the center of the uh, Illich family's investment in Detroit. Illich, for those of you who don't know, um, is the magnate of Little Caesar's Pizza. Um, Detroit, a little known fact of Detroit is we're the pizza capital of the United States, or maybe the bad pizza capital of the United States. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Little Caesars. I hope you didn't sponsor the conference. Um, uh, uh, but uh, Little Caesars uh, and Domino's is from Ann Arbor, just west of Detroit. Uh, so we, we've contributed some good pizza, too, but it's not, it hasn't gone national. Um, suffice it to say, this is uh, another attempt at urban revitalization. Uh, in this case, a mixed-use hockey arena surrounded by residential and commercial development intended uh, to reinvigorate um, that section of the city. This is our, our, uh, the architect's rendering of what Hockey Town might look like uh, after it's constructed, although one does wonder about um, the presence of a huge behemoth of a sports arena in the middle of a residential neighborhood and how much energy that's going to attract when there aren't hockey games or what kind of energy it's going to attract when there are hockey games. Um, Detroit has also um, celebrated, this was in the newspapers um, all over the place, the construction of um, uh, its first Whole Foods, a sign that a city has made it, a sign of urban revitalization. Um, uh, and uh, this Whole Foods is um, over near the hospital, medical, uh, and Wayne State University complex where the DIA and others within a short distance of there. The Charles Wright Museum is near there as well. Detroit has also become a major culinary uh, destination, and some of you may have discovered that. I had an amazing meal last night. Um, this is my dinner uh, here uh, last summer at a place called Wright uh, & Company, uh, an old jeweler that's been turned into a restaurant. Um, Detroit also has a vibrant art gallery scene. Uh, and this is an opening that I went to when I was in Detroit um, last summer as well. Um, even some of the signs of the city's impoverished past have been romantically reconstructed uh, to cheekily refer to a down-and-out deindustrial city that's come back. This is uh, a, a pawn shop uh, in the city's Corktown neighborhood called Gold Cash Gold. This photograph was taken in about uh, 2011. Um, and this is the restaurant Gold Cash Gold, uh, which serves really a really fine brunch if you're looking for somewhere to go on Sunday uh, uh, that's opened up uh, in its place, keeping many of the accoutrements of the pawn shop, uh, but cheekily reinventing them as haute cuisine. So as we think about Detroit and its landscape um, and its future, I want to lay out a couple of principles 
and then drawing from the history of urban revitalization, um, think about uh, how Detroit is reinventing itself and what uh, it can do uh, to come back from the ashes. First, a diversified labor market with well-paying, secure jobs is essential to the city's future. This may go without saying, but one of the most devastating consequences of the disappearance of manufacturing jobs in Detroit over the last half century plus has been the disappearance of jobs that make it possible for people to own and buy homes, to work one job, to have vacations, to have health care, to have a secure retirement, uh, and to live above uh, the subsistence line. Next principle. Every successful city uh, depends on density. This again may seem such an obvious thing, uh, but it's particularly important in considering the reinvention uh, of a, an automobile dependent city like Detroit. Cities that have density are capable of sustaining the cultural amenities, um, the vibrancy, and the businesses necessary uh, for uh, urban revitalization. With those two principles in mind, um, I want to raise uh, some, uh, some issues, thinking about how it is that Detroit is learning and not learning from what other cities have done. First, as you saw, at least in some of these photographs, Detroit, like many American cities, is putting its energy, most of its energy, into the reinvigoration of its downtown. This is a strategy that every major American city has pursued, every medium-sized American city has pursued, and most smaller cities have pursued over the last 60 years. It's premised on the notion that creating tourist-friendly destinations, attracting empty nesters and young professionals, people with money into the city, will inevitably spark a citywide revitalization. Downtown, however, as 60 years of urban renewal and redevelopment have shown, does not trickle down. Downtown makes it possible for conventioneers, uh, uh, frequent visitors to the city, to find amazing restaurants, bars, and coffee shops, art galleries in which to purchase art. But even Detroit's incredibly ambitious downtown revitalization plans are covering about 7.2 square miles of a 139-square-mile city. What do we do with the remaining 132, 131 or so square miles of the city? The assumption in much downtown redevelopment is that somehow the benefits of this downtown revitalization will transform the city's economy and lift uh, the city's population. Unfortunately, there's not very much evidence of that happening, even in some of the most revitalized cities. For example, Cleveland, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, an incredibly vital restaurant scene, uh, a, a, a pretty a reinvigorated downtown, um, is one of the poorest cities in the United States with incredibly high rates of unemployment. It's a small version of Detroit. It's about half the size of Detroit, um, but it's a place that has many of Detroit's woes. Or consider a more successful city by many measures, my sometime hometown of Philadelphia, uh, where uh, the downtown has seen a 90,000 person population increase in the last 20 years, uh, where there are more restaurants than I can possibly go to eat in, where there's so much energy, yet if you go two miles to the north or to the south and about three miles to the west, you're in Detroit. You're in the poorest of the top 10 cities in the United States, a city uh, that has shockingly high rates uh, of poverty and um, shockingly high rates of nearly everything else, child mortality, uh, obesity, uh, education, family, et cetera. In other words, downtown revitalization can bring in additional tax revenue, which cities like Detroit need, but it's insufficient to create the kinds of jobs uh, and the kind of vitality necessary for the vast majority of the city's residents. Next, we need to beware of the false promises of hipsterification, if I can coin a term. 
Uh, the city planner, Richard Florida, uh, has famously advocated and traveled around the world um, uh, like an like a evangelist uh, 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 with this gospel of bringing the creative class to cities, bring young artists and cultural producers, bring gays and lesbians, bring an un unspoken but mostly highly educated white people with some disposable income to cities, uh, and that will lead to a snowball effect of revitalization. And Detroit has evidence of hipsterification galore. But again, the businesses that are being created uh, in neighborhoods that are undergoing hipsterification, restaurants and coffee shops, by and large bars, uh, art galleries, do not provide the economic juice necessary to transform the economy of uh, a city with 680,000 or so people spreading over 139 square miles. The flip side of hipsterification are concerns about gentrification, which at least in the case of Detroit, and I would argue, and we can talk about it later, many other cities, um, gentrification um, is overblown as a threat to, uh, uh, the, uh, to, to cities. It, it's happening on a relatively small scale compared to um, the vast uh, problems that cities face. Next, cities need to build on what works. And I'm gonna focus on just two things very quickly to give you some examples, some hopeful examples of what works. While we're putting our energy into hipsterification and downtown revitalization, we've overlooked what was perhaps the most significant change over the last 50 years in urban economies. That is their dependence on meds and eds, hospitals and healthcare and education and on government. Detroit, as I mentioned earlier, has 8,000 auto workers. It has more than 40,000 workers uh, in uh, meds and eds. This is the Henry Ford Hospital uh, uh, here. Or, uh, or sorry, this is Detroit Receiving Hospital. Um, uh, and uh, hospitals have provided extraordinary opportunities for urban residents, particularly in the form of a wide range of jobs, from maintenance people and licensed practical nurses uh, all the way up to neurosurgeons. Uh, and Detroit's bright spot, like the bright spot of so many cities in the last 50 years, has been the significant expansion of its healthcare sector and the generation of all sorts of, of jobs as a consequence. So we need to build on what works. One of the things that works uh, in many metropolitan areas is uh, the attraction of new immigrants. I've just edited a book that will be coming out in the spring on immigration and metropolitan revitalization. Immigration has perhaps transformed American cities, particularly troubled ones, uh, in ways that have profound long-term consequences. Large parts of Brooklyn and Queens in New York were remade in the 1980s and 90s by huge waves of immigrants. Likewise, uh, most American cities that lost population before the 1990s gained population not because uh, empty nesters were moving back or white folks were moving in or hipsters were clustering around uh, uh, trendy bars and restaurants, but because immigrants were flooding in in record numbers. Chicago uh, is one very good example of that, where you can't go to nearly any neighborhood in Chicago and not see some evidence of the extraordinary uh, uh, immigration that's made it now the second largest Latino population uh, in a city in the United States uh, after Los Angeles. Detroit, by contrast, has been a relatively low immigration city. But where immigration has happened, we've seen a, a, a significant revitalization of industry uh, and commerce. This is uh, an area sometimes called Bangla Town, uh, which was populated by a few thousand Bangladeshis, most of them uh, having first arrived in New York City who were priced out, who could pick up houses for 30 or $40,000 and who have set up a vital community and reinvigorated what which was once a neighborhood left for dead. Um, this is Mexican town. Some of you may have a chance to go there. Um, Detroit has a small but growing Mexican uh, and Latin American population uh, and uh, uh, neighborhoods that have witnessed an influx of Latin American immigrants um, have also undergone significant uh, 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 revitalization, including job creation in recent years. And so in thinking about the future of the city, we need to think about what works in terms of uh, employment and what works in terms of neighborhood revitalization. Two last things. We need to think about public education, an issue that's mostly been off the table since Detroit declared its bankruptcy, but which needs to be central. 
employers, uh, depend on a highly educated workforce, and Detroit, like many cities, despite all sorts of faddish experiments in charter schools and privatization, has one of the most abysmal public education systems in the United States, and it has not received the kind of investment necessary to turn it around. Finally, we have to take a look at the ways in which Detroit's long-term legacy of racial conflict, of discrimination, of prejudice, and of segregation continue to poison the metropolitan area. This is where those of you who work on difficult histories, telling the histories of racial conflict, bringing out into the open what has mostly been swept beneath the rug, like the remarkable work that people are doing here in Detroit right now, uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Detroit 1967. We have to confront head on, not wish away, the city's long and poisonous divisions by race. They're poisonous divisions that are playing out as we speak in national politics today. Those poisonous divisions are the result of the long-term construction of borders or boundaries, invisible lines that naturalize racial difference, that separate people by race. This is perhaps one of the most graphic uh, examples of this. Um, this is the border uh, of Detroit and Gross Point Park, a suburb immediately to its east uh, along the river. Housing stock in this part of Detroit and Gross Point is almost identical. The difference? That one line right there, which is the invisible municipal boundary between the two. Here, depopulation and abandonment. Here, blocks are almost all entirely intact. Real estate value is significantly higher. As we think about boundaries, we also have to think about the most significant boundaries uh, that make, uh, sorry, I have to go back to this one, um, that, that um, still serve as barriers to uh, the successful resolution of city problems. And that is the barriers or boundaries that separate the city, that black line surrounding Detroit from um, outlying communities, uh, which are still overwhelmingly white. In thinking about Detroit, in thinking about how Detroit rises from the ashes, we can't simply wish away the city's history. We have to confront it head on. We have to think about its implications for the landscape of the city, for patterns of investment, for decisions that are made by political actors about who gets what and how much they pay for them in the form of taxes. We have to think of ways in which ultimately rising from the ashes depends on the erasure or the thinning of boundaries that determine the allocation of goods and resources that allow certain residents uh, of the United States and of metropolitan areas to hoard public goods and resources and certain others to remain afflicted largely by the accident of their birth and the color of their skin uh, from access uh, to those advantages and resources. In thinking about Detroit's revitalization, we need to think about how the city got to where it is, and we have to think beyond that one tiny little section of the city, which may hold symbolic significance, uh, and think about the needs, uh, the economy, the educational opportunities, the neighborhood shopping districts, the public resources available uh, to uh, the several hundred thousand who live beyond. Thank you. We have time for questions? Probably just a few. Ah, this, that's right, of course. Right, so um, I've been asked to remind you that there's a, a follow-up session after lunch um, in which we're gonna be discussing these issues on a round table um, and also thinking about, especially for, uh, for you, um, what I just hinted at in my presentation, which are the implications for this larger framework and thinking about the work that those of you who are involved in public history, historic houses, museums, uh, uh, and so forth um, um, can do. So, great, thank you. Also, folks, I want to let you know that we have copies of his book, Origins of the Urban Crisis, in the exhibit hall, and immediately now we're going to go and do a brief book signing. So if you have a copy of the book or if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, meet us at the museum's pop-up shop in the exhibit hall. <laughs>